Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, France and Germany are the indispensable member states of the EU for reasons of history, geography, economic weight. For both of them, they had to solve the riddle of the Rhine. And the way they solved that, and it simply, the, all the Elysee Treaty does is it manifests the fact that uh, both countries had arrived at a modus vivendi, uh, they had reconciled after the war, and that they had solved, finally, the riddle of the Rhine, a very old riddle. Uh, and how do we describe that relationship? Well, you hear talk of le couple franco-allemand, so the couple, that implies a relationship. You hear of the engine or motor of integration, that implies the purpose. So in terms, firstly, of the relationship, uh, they obviously reconciled within the EU, but also their reconciliation is probably the most powerful symbol of the success of the EU itself as a peace project. And that has projected itself both beyond the original six to many other member states and now to the full continent of Europe and internationally. It was probably for me symbolized most acutely in 1984 when uh, as the Marseillaise was being uh, played at Verdun, when Mitterrand, he stretched out his hand to Cole. And I think for me, and I show it to my students, it is perhaps one of the most moving symbols of two peoples that were finally saying, it is, uh, it is truly over. But I think the relationship goes much deeper than this. It is the, the most institutionalized bilateral relationship between any two countries, I think, in the international system. The meetings for breakfast between the cabinets, the bilaterals right across the ministerial system, and of course then the meetings at the heads of state and government. I don't think there are any other two countries in the world with that level and intensity of bilateral relations across the entire spectrum uh, of the state and public policy. Uh, also, the relationship, particularly in the 1960s, and we heard about it, was also people to people. It started what has now become commonplace in Europe, Erasmus, but the student engagement in the 1960s, the town twinning, but that has changed, and it's changed because in the 1960s it might have been very exotic to go from Bonn to Paris. Nowadays, young people want to go to uh, Rio de Janeiro or Buenos Aires or uh, Bangkok or wherever. Going to Paris is no longer quite as exotic uh, as it once was. So I, I do understand that the people-to-people -people relationship is, is now different. In terms of the purpose of this relationship, uh, for the EU, I would say it has two interrelated purposes. The first is positive and active leadership, and that manifests itself in the big, big projects. And I look back, Brandt and Pompidou, it was enlargement and the relaunch of integration post de Gaulle, Schmidt and Destin, the EMS, it would not and could not have happened without them, Cole and Mitterrand, well, that was probably, in the history of integration, in a sense, one of the most long-lasting because it had to deal with a very complex set of issues. Chirac and Cole, not so close. No evident big project emerged. Chirac and Schroeder, again, not so close, but they did manage a reform of the cap, uh, and they did launch the Constitutional Convention. Mercosi. This was not a cosy relationship. Uh, it was a partnership of necessity driven from the extraordinary crisis that the euro faced. Uh, it was not based on a convergence of views, but it was indispensable to keep to, so that the euro states could finally begin to deal with the crisis and respond. And the relationship between the now chancellor and the now French president has not settled into a predictable pattern. Uh, there is no Merkelland or whatever phrase one might use for it. It's not functioning as an inner core or a privileged partnership in, any, uh, in, in the way in which those relationships have uh, functioned in the past. That doesn't mean that of necessity, post the election, that they will not begin to function in this way again. Uh, the other important role that the Franco-German relationship plays in the EU is that because they are so different, and that's been referred to uh, already, because they are so different and because they very frequently have very different preferences about policy solutions, their relationship, prevent, what they must do is prevent their disagreement 
becoming a serious cleavage in integration. And therefore, what, what it, as functionally within the EU, what it does is if the Franco-German relationship can manage and mediate their internal conflict, it makes the rest of the management of the EU system uh, more simpler. But to move from the purpose and function and the how of this relationship to whether or not we're seeing shifts, in other words, the continuity and change, I think there has been a shift in the power balance in this relationship. When, in the, when de Gaulle and Adenauer signed the Elysee Treaty in the 60s, one could argue convincingly that French political power uh, somehow or other mediated German economic power. France was one of the four powers in Berlin still, had a seat on the European Security Council and had its force de frappe. Over the years, as, uh, and particularly post-unification, and again now with the performance of the German economy, I think there has been a shift. I think that France, it is not a co-equal relationship anymore, and I think that's probably structural. Uh, in other words, and this is particularly in, econom in the economic realm, France has influence, but not quite the power that it once had. And remember also that in an EU that stretches from southern Portugal right up to the borders of Russia and down into the Balkans, as we will have, then Germany is geographically located in the centre of Europe and France is a West European power. And I think for reasons of geography also, there have been shifts. In terms of the future, these two countries have very different views and continue to have very different views about the trajectory of European integration. France remains a country that is, is, it is statist in its history, it is statist in its reflexes, uh, and Germany also has a very strong sense of how you run an economy, uh, the ordo liberalism. So these are very different ways of running an economy. Uh, Germany would be at the more open end in terms of trade, it is a very powerful trading state, whereas France is constantly worried about liberalisation unless it's liberalisation in areas where they're very strong, in other words in electricity or whatever, let's have lots of liberalisation in electricity but not so much in other, in other areas, and in terms of the relationship to the global international trading system, France would tend to be more protectionist in its instincts than Germany. Uh, also, very different views about the future of integration. Uh, if one listens to what Hollande is saying today, he wants a social Europe followed by a political Europe, where, in other words, solidarity followed by the politics, whereas from Berlin, the view would certainly be that you must have stronger political interaction and political union, and then maybe you talk about mutuality and solidarity, etc., etc. And these are very, very different. We also need to think about the other dynamics in the EU. What are the other potentials of subsystem politics in the EU? There was a time in the 1980s when you could argue that the EU had a Paris, Bonn, London triad. Although Paris, Bonn was much stronger than Paris, London or Bonn, London, but there was a sense in which that, that there was a triad. That's not there now. There's no evidence it will be there again. I think it's a major shift uh, in the dynamic of the system in terms of subsystem politics. In other words, the what, what, what will the United Kingdom do about its relationship with the, other, with, with the system? And I also think we need to think a little of Poland. Uh, it is too early because Poland still needs a lot of economic modernization and has a long way to go. But I think 20 years down the line, one will see uh, a Warsaw, Berlin, Paris. And one needs to think about that. In other words, that it's not just the Franco-German couple at the heart of the system, that those other changing dynamics matter. In terms of the future relationship, I'm very glad that both speakers referred to the Common Foreign and Security Policy, or ESDP, because this is where this relationship barely doesn't function and has no, uh, no role to play. And I was very struck again on Mali that it was the British uh, offered the two transport planes immediately to, to, to France. And these are, Britain and France are the only two countries in Europe 
that have both a capacity but also a willingness to deploy force. Uh, and that, again, is something that distinguishes both those countries as large countries from Germany. Uh, and whether Germany can afford to retain this position uh, over the next 20 to 30 years, given the security environment around Europe, is another matter. I'd like to end by saying something about what the nature of this relationship and what its implications are for other member states, and particularly small member states. Every small member state in the EU has got to be extremely attentive to the Franco-German relationship. They've also got to ensure that that relationship is exercised in a way that aids rather than uh, undermines the formal structures of the EU. And one of the really worrying issues in the EU during this crisis is that time and time and time again, the informal was trumping the formal institutions of the EU. And I think that the so-called uh, beach walk in Deauville was, for me, where it was really symbolized that here were two heads of state and government meeting uh, in a, on a beautiful beach uh, in Normandy discussing the future of the euro at the same time the euro group was meeting in Luxembourg and working all day long to, to come to an agreement on economic governance and at five o'clock in the evening got a phone call to say what had been agreed uh, by uh, the, two, the two political leaders. Uh, so I think there needs to be, it is indispensable, it works for the system, it is necessary for the system, but it does matter how both these large states behave, and they must always bring issues back on into the formal structures of the EU, because it is only in the formal structures of the EU, both in terms of institutions and process and procedure, that small states get essential protection in the system. Uh, there's been a lot of debate over the years as to whether the EU needs a directoire, uh, and of course, uh, the small states always worry about a directoire. Uh, I don't think there ever will be a formal, formal directoire, but there could be a de facto directoire uh, operating within the system anyway. So I think that it is really important for small states to be attentive, to be vocal if necessary, uh, and to ensure that the way in which decisions are made uh, marry the importance of this unique relationship but also with the right of all uh, states in the EU to have voice and presence on issues that affect all of us. Uh, and so, in other words, I would sum that up by saying uh, it is important for small states to ensure that the informal uh, does not trump the formal. That said, this is an indispensable relationship to the EU. It has functioned to the benefit of all of Europe and the EU, by and large, uh, with some uh, neuralgic issues from time to time uh, and it does matter to the future of the EU that these two large states at the core of the core uh, continue to ensure that their relationship is functional for the rest of Europe but it is in my view entering a difficult time uh, as the EU and particularly the euro area struggles to retrofit a system that was clearly not fit for purpose. Uh, and the stakes are very high over the next five to 10 years as uh, the euro area, uh, as the euro, euro area decides on what are really major issues uh, for all of us as citizens of this part of the world. Thank you. Thank you.